Hi, my name is Derek, and this is DC to Daylight. In this video, we'll be taking a look at strain gauges and how one would connect it to a Wheatstone bridge in order to take a useful measurement. Oftentimes, strain gauges are employed as sensors in monitoring stress or strain in some mechanical component or system, which could be an I-beam as part of a bridge, a torque force sensor, or attached to a load cell inside of a small scale. Though I've run across them primarily in the robotics field, I don't fully understand some of the design and physical placement considerations. So I thought it would be fun to take a look at a generalized application and hook it up to Wheatstone Bridge and see just how sensitive it is. So let's get right into strain gauges. A strain gauge measures, oddly enough, the strain imposed on some system by an applied force. We'll touch on exactly what that means in a minute, but it is difficult to actually measure what's going on inside of a solid structural element like an aircraft wing. So we're left to take an indirect measurement on the surface. The strain gauge itself is composed of a plastic flexible substrate, and on the surface, a metallic conductive element, about five micrometers thick, is applied in a specific and deliberate pattern. As the shape of the strain gauge is stretched, bent, or twisted, the resistance of the material changes. If we look at the formula for resistance, we can see why the resistive foil is patterned the way it is. If we have a material with a certain conductivity, we can multiply that by the ratio of the physical length of the resistor divided by the cross-sectional area. Well, these guys have to measure a very small change in physical dimension, so it's important that we provide enough resistance for it to do its job and allow us to take a measurement. The output voltage uh, will be proportional to the resistance, and the change in both will be very, very small. Now, if the strain gauge is bent upward relative to the substrate, the resistive element will elongate. Notice in our formula, that means the resistance will increase. If we bend the strain gauge into compression, the resistive element is in contraction and the resistance actually decreases. If we can glue this thing to the surface of an object and we put enough stress and strain on it, the object will change shape and our strain gauge along with it. The difference between stress and strain is a little confusing on the surface, but we need to know the difference. Here's a chunk of aluminum. If we apply an external force to this column, there's a force exerted in the opposite direction by all of the atoms that make up the material. If we divide that internal force by the cross-sectional area of the column, then that is equal to the amount of stress. There's that pesky cross-sectional area again. Anyway, so stress is the relationship between the area and the amount of force applied. Cool, what about strain? Well, strain is the amount that the structure deforms by changing in length or in diameter. A device could change shape in a number of ways. It could extend, it could compress, or it could twist or bend. So we really need to think about what it is we're measuring, which will determine the type of strain gauge, its orientation, and the nominal resistance that we select off the shelf. Let's pretend that for now, we're interested in the length of the column and how it changes under stress. If we squish that column, it changes in length by some unit of measure. And we can say that the change is the original length plus or minus the new length which I'm calling delta L. If we divide that by the original length, then the ratio is the strain, denoted as epsilon. Not only would the column contract if we push on it, but it also bulges a bit orthogonal to the longitudinal axis of strain. This is called lateral strain. Maybe in the real world we'd measure both, but in this example we'll focus on the compression along its length. One last thing we need to think about before we go and stick our strain gauge on something and give it a good what fur, every material has a certain point where we can bend it and then it can return to its original shape. This is a material's elasticity. If we bend it more and more, at some point it doesn't return back to its original shape. It becomes permanently deformed when the load is removed. This is a material's plasticity. It so happens that we can divide the stress sigma by the strain epsilon, and the resulting constant value E gives us what's called Young's modulus. The linear region of this graph is the elastic region, and here we can bend some stuff like stainless steel and it'll go back to its original shape bend it too far, and we end up in the plastic region where it's permanently deformed. If we continue to add force, we see more and more travel along the x-axis or the strain axis, and the material will eventually fail. But hey, this is an electronics channel, isn't it? So let's get back to electronics. So just as the length or diameter of our column can change, we should ask ourselves, how much will the resistance change? Enough to measure? Well, we can take the math from the Young's modulus bit and figure out exactly how much it changes with that deformation but I don't want to get into the weeds any more than we already have. Just know that there is a constant called the gauge factor K in the data sheet, and that will tell you how much the resistance will change based on the strain or deformation. Okay, usually it's two. Yeah, two. Check the data sheet. <laughs> now, if we wanted to calculate the change in resistance for stainless steel, that has a Young's modulus of 200 gigapascals. 
If we apply 100 megapascals of force and use a strain gauge with a resistance of 120 ohms, which is fairly common, we'd find delta R, the change in resistance, is equal to the nominal resistance times the gauge factor of two times the strain, which we said was epsilon. Therefore, delta R is equal to 120 times our gauge factor of two times our strain, which is epsilon, and that comes out to uh, 500 micro epsilon. And that translates to 120 milliohms. Yeah, 120 milliohms. So we're talking very small changes in resistance that we have to measure. How are we gonna measure something that small? So in order to measure a value that small, we need to employ a Wheatstone bridge, which is very sensitive to a change in resistance or a resistance imbalance within the bridge. From there, we could do some more signal conditioning and maybe feed the Wheatstone output to an op amp of some sort. If you're interested in learning more about Wheatstone bridges, you're in luck because we just did a video on that subject. So if you wanna know more, just click up there. Now, as far as orientation, the strain gauge should be mounted so the linear section of the resistive foil is along the axis where the strain will occur. If we're orthogonal to that, there is not much of a change in resistance, so we're kind of selective in our orientation. As far as the Wheatstone bridge configuration, we can utilize only one or all four sections of the Wheatstone bridge, depending on how many sensors we use. If using a single sensor, then it's sufficient to place it on one side of the bridge. However, we can get a larger voltage amplitude from the bridge if we use the upper and lower sections of one side of the bridge. This will double our output voltage, but we need to place the sensors on opposing sides of the structure that we're measuring. So I'm not gonna go into uh, the voltage versus resistance measurement, but I'll put these equations here for your reference and finding the Wheatstone output voltage for a one gauge system, a two gauge system, and also a four gauge system. I'm gonna demo a stainless steel shim stock. So I'll be using the two gauge system and we'll mount them on opposing sides of the shim, really measuring the bending moment. So there will be compression on one side and elongation right on the other side. Now let's take a look at how to stick this thing onto our stainless steel shim stock. So here are all the materials that we're going to use today to attach the strain gauge to this feeler gauge. So it's just a 0.01 or 10 thou thick piece of stainless steel, 0.254 millimeters. We're going to attach a strain gauge to the top side as well as the bottom side. And in connecting those two strain gauges in our bridge circuit, that'll give us the maximum output for measuring this type of thing. We're just going to measure the bending moment. Now the strain gauge on top is going to experience elongation, while the one on the uh, bottom side is going to contract. So we'll have an increase in resistance on the top if we bend down, and a decrease in resistance on the bottom, okay, because it's kind of curling up. So here are all the materials that we're going to use today. We've got some scotch tape that we're going to use to uh, stick the strain gauge temporarily to the surface of this and also to our substrate here uh, so that we can ensure that it's clean. Okay, it'll be like a staging area, all right? And these are the strain gauges themselves. They're uh, individually packaged. I think they should be matched. So we'll just grab a couple out of here and begin the process. So the tape is gonna do that for us. Uh, we're using a cyanacrylate glue to uh, attach this to our metal surface. Uh, before we attach it, we're gonna have to use the sandpaper to uh, rough it up a little bit. Typically, most manufacturers recommend 200 grit. Um, I don't have any, I only have 180 and 1000, so I'm gonna use the 1000 today. But the basic idea is we're gonna rough up the surface to make sure that we can, you know, the, the glue has some purchase and can stay on there. Because the whole idea of this is we wanna bend this piece of metal and we want the strain gauge to bend along with it so we can actually measure something, right? Now, prepping the surface of this thing is a really big deal to make sure that it stays on here. And you wanna make sure that you have a clean surface. You're not on top of paint or anything. You wanna make sure you have all the grease off. And in general, the same idea as for like TIG welding applies to uh, the sensors here. We want to get all the grease off before we start working on it. And acetone is probably a good chemical to use as well as isopropyl alcohol, which I'll be using today. Um, of course, any kind of pickling solution that's designed for stainless steel, uh, which would be a slightly acidic thing, um, I would just stay away from HF or hydrofluoric acid because it is um, rather hard on your calcium if you get it on your skin. Uh, and it actually absorbs into your skin, so avoid that. Uh, hydrochloric acid, a very dilute um, hydrochloric acid is also a good thing. And then of course, you wanna get some water on it to make sure that uh, you neutralize it. I've also got these pads. Now, I would not use these cotton ones like I'm using. You should be using something like Kim Wipes or even the synthetic clean room uh, pads to wipe these things down. But we'll start the process. So what I wanna do is grab my substrate here. Um, normally, you'd probably use a piece of glass but uh, all I have is this piece of acrylic. So we'll start with that, it's nice and clean, but I'm gonna go ahead and hit it with some IPA anyway. I'm gonna wipe in one direction, flip it, and I'm gonna go back in the opposite direction. So I went this way and then I kind of half overlapped this way. 
right? So you can still see some particulate on there, but yeah, this is just a demonstration. I know people that you do this professionally are really cringing right now, but um, I'm new, cut me some slack. So here are my strain gauges. You can purchase these on newark.com. Their resistance ranges are usually pretty low. They're like, these are I think are 120 ohms and you don't wanna scratch them. So I'm being very careful not to do that. 120 ohms uh, up to a thousand ohms I think is pretty typical. So here's a better look at these guys. Yeah, you can see I still have some particulate on this substrate, but anyway, it's not perfect. But you can see that these come pre-wired with magnet wire and they're pre-tinned on the end as well. Sometimes they don't come with wires attached and you do have to solder them after you attach them to your substrate. So something to watch out for. So I'm just gonna tape these down. All right, just do that. Okay, just so they don't go anywhere. Okay, and I'll just move those out of the way. Now we need to set up our surface to mount those guys to. So what I'm gonna do is uh, most of the bending is going to occur in this portion here once I clamp this down. Um, so I do have some overlap on these letters. Normally you wouldn't want that. You'd kind of mark out with a number two pencil where you wanna do it and then just wipe it off and that kind of burnishes a line in it. Um, which you can still see, but it does not affect the metal. You don't want to gouge it because your strain gauge isn't going to sit properly and flat on the surface. So anyway, well, I'm going to go ahead and start sanding this. Well, actually, let's wipe it down first. So I'm just going to get both sides. Then we're going to sand it. So we're just going to go in little circles, small circles, and we're just roughing up the surface, really. I'll do the other side. And it depends on the application, how you wipe it down, but you just want to go in the same direction. Okay. I'm going to wait for it to dry. I'm going to flip my pad over to the other side, and then I'm just going to take it and wipe it the other way. And now we should have a really clean grease and particulate free surface. And then I'm going to pull one of these off at a shallow angle. And these do have their own young modulus. So if you exceed that, you could certainly damage it. I'm gonna say right about here. I should have marked this, but you get the idea. Okay. And what we're doing is giving it a seat and then we're gonna peel this back, throw a bit of glue on there and then hold it down. And it's as simple as that. All right, so let's go ahead and peel this back again at a shallow angle. Okay, just gonna fold it back. And now what we're gonna do is just put a drop of glue at the base here. It doesn't need to be much. And then we're just gonna squeegee that down. Okay. And that should be plenty of glue. And then we're just gonna hold that there for uh, about two minutes under pressure. And then when we're done with this, uh, we'll let it sit for another couple of minutes to make sure the curing process is complete. And then we'll peel it back. It's not exactly lined up perfectly, but uh, it'll be okay for what we're doing today. I'm going to peel it back at 180 degrees. You can see there's some residue from the tape, but that's okay. Oh, our tape has torn. So I'm just going to do the same thing to the other side and uh, I don't want to bore you guys to death. So I will flip this over, clean it and do it again. Mm -hmm. All right, so the last thing we need to do is secure the wires to whatever we're measuring so they don't uh, rip off basically. Um, so I'm just going to use some Kapton tape because that's what I got hanging around. I'm just going to do that. And for this application, I'm just going to shave it right off. Got kind of a lot going on in the frame here, so uh, let me just explain what's going on. So we've got our feeler gauge, of course, that we've got our uh, string gauges mounted to on the top side and the bottom side. Those wires come over to our breadboard, and uh, this is where our Wheatstone bridge is set up. I have two resistors here, variable potentiometers, uh, that I can use to balance the bridge out in the idle state. Uh, they're 200 ohms each, so of course, on the other side, I have the top side strain gauge and the bottom part of the Wheatstone bridge, the uh, green and yellow wires or are for the uh, bottom sensor. The output of the Wheatstone bridge are the two, these two uh, tinned wires here that I've got going over to my multimeter so I can measure uh, the voltage here in the plus and minus direction. Let's go ahead and put some pressure on this thing. If I push it down, it goes in a positive direction and it only changes to like eight millivolts. We can see that we got about nine, 10 millivolts and if I go beyond this, I'm probably getting out of the elastic region into the plastic region, so I'm not gonna push it too much further than that. I should see a negative if I go the other way, and I do. Negative nine, 10 millivolts, okay. So one thing that we could do to increase the sensitivity of this thing is to uh, connect some kind of like instrumentation amplifier or a simple op amp to the output of this, a differential amp, and uh, increase the voltage. 
Uh, so we could do all kinds of things. Uh, but if you're sending this over to an ADC, uh, you probably would want to, before you take a measurement, do some kind of calibration routine to kind of null out this uh, offset. This was pretty cool. I really enjoyed seeing uh, how this thing worked. I hope you did too. It actually changes a lot less than I thought it would. You know, using a strain gauge like this, uh, you know, we're seeing single digit millivolts. The kind of strain that uh, a robot would probably see would be uh, in the order of tens of microvolts. So, you know, you'd have to take some special considerations when you're hooking this up to an op amp to filter out certain noise. You'd probably have to put a low pass filter in it. Uh, to, to get rid of any garbage that's uh, picked up on the line. So anyway, this was really cool, and I you know, hope you guys got a kick out of it. And uh, I think that wraps it up for this demo. Well, that's it for strain gauges, and as always, I hope you've learned something. I know when I started researching this video, I learned a ton of new information, as I'm no mechanical engineer. But it was really interesting combining mechanical and electrical engineering principles to make measurement on strain. What was even more useful was to see how much or how little the resistance and voltage output changed with a certain amount of deflection. But at least now I have a frame of reference for how strain gauges behave and I can apply that to the next project. Now, if you have any extensive experience with strain gauges, I would absolutely love to hear your input on what I did right and what I did wrong. Also, if you've used them on the, on the job, I'd also like to hear about your experience. So click the link down below, which takes you over to the Element 14 community. There we can talk about this subject and share pictures, schematics, and all of that good stuff. Of course, hit me up down in the comments. Um, as well, I always try to respond to everyone. Okay, well, that's it for me, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one.